cool. Welcome everyone to this panel. Uh, for me, it's kind of a dream panel for open source sustainability because I think we have the best people um, on earth that could talk about this. Um, and I think just you know introducing yourselves in like 15 seconds will be really really useful for for people to know more. So you wanna go first, Aya? Okay. Um, hello everyone. My name is Aya Miyaguchi. I'm executive director of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, for people who do not know very much about what the foundation does, I think a lot of people actually do not know. <laughs> uh, we support, I think our law has shifted, or I think, we, I believe our law should shift, um, but the foundation is um, the originally founded to build Ethereum, and then now it is not only the EF who is building Ethereum, um, so now our role is, the main role is to support all the ecosystem players to work with us or work with other players to finish building Ethereum. So all the activities that is uh, related to that, uh, we do that, including uh, communication, education, grant program, um, yes. Thank you. Olivier? Hi, everyone. Uh, so yes, I'm Olivier. I'm the, the lead, uh, lead dev of Pondo, which is a decentralized versioning system, like a you know, decentralized alternative to Git, uh, which is funded by uh, an Aragon Nest grant. And yeah, so we are trying to tackle the problem of open source sustainability by developing some kind of uh, dependency and contribution tracking system, which allows to track, okay, who has contributed to what, what are the dependencies of my repo, uh, what other repo I have forked at some point, and to keep track of all this relation between all the repos on chain, so that if one of them gains an income at some point by magic, you know, it can be split and flow up to the dependency tree. So it's a way to kind of try to solve this open source sustainability issue uh, that way. But Thanks, Olivier. Taylor? Awesome. Hi, I'm Taylor Monahan. I am the founder and CEO of MyCrypto. Previously, I founded My Ether Wallet. Uh, both are completely open source projects. Um, I actually didn't have a lot of experience in open source before starting My Ether Wallet and then uh, My Crypto. So it's been a pretty magical experience, I would say. Um, you know, f especially moving from uh, the mentality that you have to build the moats and everything should be private and this is your um, this is your property and and it's secret and that's what gives it value to pretty much the exact opposite where uh, our products are powerful and valuable for completely different reasons and we can give all the source code uh, and even the compiled code out for free and put it on the internet and that actually enhances the product and the project and the company um, and it makes it more valuable. So hopefully I can speak a little bit more about that today. Thanks Taylor, very curious about that. Uh, Yandon? Hey everyone, my name is Yandon. I'm a researcher and software engineer at LivePeer which is working on decentralized video streaming infrastructure. So probably of most relevance to this panel, we're pretty interested in uh, being able to create sustainable open source video streaming software at LivePeer. But uh, in the past, previous to LivePeer, I had also uh, done some studies on sustainable open source funding models as a part of my undergraduate thesis. So I spent some time learning and exploring that area. And that was ultimately motivated by identifying that open source software is kind of the fundamental fabric of everything that we're building for this more and more digital society. So it's an interesting problem space to explore with everyone. Yeah, so um, so going back to that actually, so one of the, my, um, the aha moments that I had with open source sustainability was actually reading Open Collabs white paper by John Dong, which is like a very short paper as like the very good papers are, such as Bitcoins, um, that really opened my eyes because Something that is very interesting, and I want you uh, and I want your your opinion on this. But basically, something that happens in the crypto space is that we are solving the tragedy of the commons, but at the same time, the core protocols that we have that are supposed to solve the tragedy of the commons are having the tragedy of the commons themselves. So we're having this very ironic situation where sometimes the protocols that power uh, a blockchain, for example, are either underfunded or we don't really have you know enough enough eyes on on them. So I'm, I'm very curious to think what is your take on open source sustainability for, for crypto? And I think we can just go in order and have like a quick overview of what you think about open source sustainability and why it is important in the crypto space. Should I start? Um, I think, well, we are building this system to make the world more distributed uh, or decentralized, like 
you know, like power should be distributed and also the decentralized. And with that, that is our vision. And then with that, it's very, very important to keep the, the, this technology open source. Um, if we have small numbers of um, big powers control this or own this, um, it will defeat the purpose. And and then so the, the even Ethereum like foundation was funded like we don't own Ethereum, no one owns Ethereum. That's why otherwise I don't think this this ecosystem has evolved this big. Um, um, so we've seen the power of open source. And then all the project that even the one that are within, like you think, are our in-house project, which such as gas or like none of those pro pro projects are only done by the members of the Ethereum Foundation. It's all collaborative effort. Um, or and it is it, it has started working. I think um, we do have that. Like you said, how do we fund, how do we financially support those open source developers or project? But I think this crypto is actually creating new funding mechanism. That's why even as a foundation, we don't really try to create revenue like other normal foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so compared to the conventional way, uh, like, like bef so I try to learn a lot about open source project from the past. But it's actually, I thought what we are doing is uh, uh, something new. Mm. And um, so we're, we <coughs> have the power that the former open source project didn't have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All yours? Yes, uh, I, I agree. I, I think, well, obviously, the, the reason why open source is important to crypto is, well, there is, uh, at the beginning, there is this uh, like security requirement. Uh, people grant a lot of trust to this kind of software, so we can't even think about closing the source code, you know. Um, but I think there are more a uh, deep reason, which is I think open source can be uh, somehow like the crash tests of crypto, because uh, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of, one of the reasons uh, so many people come to, to crypto is to say, oh, okay, maybe there we have a way to re-engineer economy, to re-engineer what the market is, and maybe it's not just about uh, supply and demand and stuff like that, and, and maybe we can make our own rule. And I think open source and the question of open source sustainability is really interesting regarding that problem, because open source is like, uh, the worst problem almost because it's like, okay, let, let's take something which by design is not a commodity, like it's made not to be one, and let's try to figure out if we can engineer something like a market or an economic sustainability process around that. And when you think about it, it can sound kind of crazy because, well, it's made not to be a community, by the way. So, uh, so I think, well, if we manage to solve our uh, even partially the problem of open source to sustainability, it will also be some kind of a model for other problem crypto is trying to solve about how can we re-engineer the market, why not replicating the same mistakes or the same problems that the market enforces on the actual existing world. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Taylor? So I think one of the most interesting things about open source in general is that it requires a mind shift. And that mind shift um, is also one that's required to sort of buy into the crypto space or, or the blockchain space. And um, if you think and truly believe that what we're building and what we're doing in the cryptocurrency space or, or with the blockchain um, is valuable and is going to be more and more valuable over time, um, it's quite easy to also sort of buy into the mindset of open source. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we're going to have is, you know, as this space grows and as it becomes more diverse and as you have bigger companies entering the space and as you have um, bigger, bigger companies uh, or established corporations, um, you know, having them also buy into that mindset and valuing community and working together and openness and decentralization over their more traditional thought patterns is going to be immensely important. Um, and it could be, like I imagine it could be very easy for this space to be sucked into the more traditional way of doing things. And it's one of the reasons that I think it's incredibly important for us here today that are all pretty much of the same mindset and see the value of an open source to really focus on understanding where that value comes from, 
uh, creating more value, helping each other out, uh, researching, exploring, doing all of these things to really ensure that um, you know, as this space grows and becomes more established, we don't fall into those old dark patterns. Um, so everyone who's really focused on creating products or creating companies or doing research in this space, you know, I applaud them and I would encourage everyone to do more. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so I definitely agree with the points about uh, cryptocurrencies serving as a very interesting new tool that wasn't previously available to open source communities. And then the point about uh, crypto, the cri cryptocurrency space being an interesting test bed for the larger open source community. Uh, I think at the same time, it's useful to be wary and tread with caution with something like this because uh, the reality is that funding isn't the one core issue at open source sustainability. Uh, it, so open source has a massive like social coordination problem, like support comes in many ways, even outside of financial resources, there needs to be technical tools built out, social processes that are more mature. And I think it's great because this, everyone in this space, we kind of like stand on the shoulders of giants in that we have learned so much from existing open source communities that have developed over the past few decades. Um, but adding something like uh, monetary incentives into the process is something not to be uh, taken lightly. I think it's very powerful, but at the same time, it's kind of like a Pandora's box in that once you unleash that into a project, it kind of changes the social dynamics with that project a lot. So we should all think carefully about like how we want to introduce it, uh, but that shouldn't prevent us from experimenting at the same time because now we have this interesting new tool available to us. Yeah. Actually, about these new tools that we have, um, can you talk a little bit more about Open Collab and how you came out with this vision to make open source sustainable? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, it's funny because I wrote that paper like almost two years ago now, and we've definitely learned so much through all the different things that people have worked on in the space. But to highlight my original motivation, it was thinking about what it actually means for an open source project to be sustainable. Uh, and I have to give credits to other people for uh, borrowing these ideas from them. One example is, so Nadia Eggball, who researches open source communities, uh, had this great paper called uh, Roads and Bridges that discusses this particular topic. And she highlights uh, two main factors that you should take into consideration for a, health, for a sustainable open source project, namely health and support, where health you can measure as how adequately and actively developers actually cater to the demands and needs of the users. And then support is uh, both financial resources and technical resources. So you can think of technical resources as what does GitHub give you that helps you maintain a project? Like if you have no tools available, it doesn't matter if you have all the funding available. If the tools aren't available for you to manage the project, you're kind of screwed anyway. Um, so trying to identify that and then realizing that one of the hardest jobs as someone that works in open source is being a maintainer and you have extremely scarce attention. I was curious if there could be a potential funding model that also helps with this problem and helps allocate attention across uh, the various things that an open source maintainer would have to do and give them an actual incentive to actually stick around and keep working on the project and help with issue triage, onboarding new users. So the paper at a high level just described, uh, I guess, something that's popular now, like curation markets is a variant of a curation market, except its goal is to use tokens as a way to allocate attention towards particular GitHub issues that are on a project sprint board. Um, a lot of these ideas are being taken further than what was originally presented there by teams like Pando and other teams in this space. Uh, but the general idea was using a scarce resource like a token in order to allocate attention across these various issues and then have an inflation funding model that can be split across the maintainer that actually does the code review in addition to the contributor itself. Um, the idea behind that was that stuff like bounties are great. Uh, but they ultimately focus on contributors, and contributors are really important, but they're not, the they're not the only player in this open source project. Ultimately, once you have a flood of contributors, your bottleneck ends up being maintainers, and that's not exactly always the most glorious position because you don't actually get to work on a lot of interesting technical problems in a lot of cases. You have to do management. You have to do deal with like onboarding, and that's not exactly the most glamorous 
role in a lot of people's eyes. So uh, it's important not to have that bottleneck. So the intention behind the mechanism of splitting inflationary rewards between maintainers and contributors was uh, an attempt to start taking steps toward that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that model is mind blowing, and I cannot like wait until we have models that actually like work like that, and we have stuff like Panda out there, and people actually use that stuff. Um, backing it up to today, I have like a very concrete question for Taylor. So, you guys are basically like powering like a lot of users, but not only in the technical side, but also like the support side. You get a lot of support requests, and you basically are like the ones that kind of help everyone hand by hand to like get into crypto. Um, do you get a lot of open source contributions? Mm -hmm. So. Um, it varies. We have, uh, right now at this moment, we have very specific things in our project that get a lot of contributors. Um, and it used to be quite different. So I'm gonna start from the beginning. One of the most remarkable things that I have ever experienced and really kind of like blew my mind was back when um, I wanted to have the site translated into like a whole variety of languages. And so I made like these files, they were JSON files, they had every single string in English in the thing. And I basically reached out to like the community, which on that time was like pretty much Reddit, right? Like all of Ethereum was on Reddit. And I said, hey, we want to get this translated. If you know another language besides English, help us out. And we had very specific instructions on how to go into these files. Uh, don't delete the quotations, don't edit the colons, like just edit the strings. Um, and we basically empowered people from around the globe to translate our entire website at no cost to us. And then what was actually more interesting, which is a little bit of what you were making a point about, is that then we had some languages that were maybe half translated or weren't translated, and I started you know, going out and trying to find people to translate these. And I figured, hey, if I put a bounty on it, if I add some monetary incentive to it, then they'll be translated like that. The reality was, is that the second we added that monetary value, we actually had less interest in translating those files because the motivations and the incentives had changed rather than, hey, I have this skill or I have this talent or I have this whatever uh, and I can contribute to this product and, and I can uh, make the product better and, and therefore the entire Ethereum ecosystem better. Now it was okay, is this worth, say, $100 or $500 or $1,000 or $50 or whatever it was? And we found that the interest just like fell off the map. It was really interesting. Um, and, and I think the reason is, is that one of the most powerful things about open source is that you have the ability to empower people to come together to make your product or the ecosystem or whatever it is better and stronger. And people are enticed by that. They find... Um, an immense amount of satisfaction from doing that. And so uh, now, today, what we do is we, we have a balance. For some of the more, uh, we can call them like grunt work, right? Those, those tedious tasks that no one really wants to do, but they're great entry-level tasks. They don't have immense effect on our code base, but someone has to do them. We love putting bounties on those because the reality is um, I you're not, it's not likely that people are going to get satisfaction out of doing those tasks, so that monetary incentive helps. But the biggest sort of features that we find contributors for are, are twofold. One is um, if someone who personally uses our product has an issue with something, say an error message isn't clear enough, um, say the confirmation modal could be more clear, or they want to make something bigger or whatever, people who use our product will go in and like make that little change, and we love those. And then the other one is um, people that typically on other Ethereum-based networks, so like Rootstock's one example of this, they have some specific feature for that network that they want to uh, enable on our product. So for example, Rootstock recently added the, uh, their name service so that their names are now resolved. And that's not something that we would ever do because we're just not in that community, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know anything about it, et cetera, but we're able to work with that team um, in order to get that feature on and then everyone benefits. Another great example is Chronologic and their uh, scheduling feature, so you can like send a transaction at a later time. Chronologic was solely responsible for getting that feature actually in. We worked with them uh, to help them understand the code base and, and things like that, but they were really you know, leading the, the front on that. Um, and, and one of the things that you know, I'm thinking about for this coming year is how do we continue to incentivize both 
teams mm -hmm. who may have a feature or a protocol or something that they want in our product, um, but also just general people who want to make our product better. How do you call attention to the things that need you know the most help with? Um, how do you how do you incentivize and not necessarily financially, but incentivize people to take the action and feel empowered? Um, and and I don't have a lot of great answers for those, but we're definitely going to be experimenting. And if yeah. uh, anyone out there has any great experiences, I'd love to hear them. Awesome. Yeah, I think I think you touch upon a very interesting point, which is the fact that sometimes if you have open source contributors and you put bounties to it, it kind of removes a little bit of the essence of like that community feeling and you may get some like mercenaries and not use like community people. So how do we, how do we get that balance, Olivier? How do you think that with something like Pando, um, you can actually create, uh, when Pando is on mainnet, which is gonna be very soon, you can actually incentivize your community to participate uh, while still getting the core essence of your community? Yeah, uh, actually that's a really tricky question, I guess, but a really important one, how you like balance the uh, feeling of belonging to the project and the economic incentive, which is also important, but can kill the first one. Um, the way we, we deal with that in Pondo is that, um, so basically this whole contribution tracking system relies uh, on a token that you uh, are granted with when you push a contribution, it, it's accepted. Um, but obviously that token is not, uh, is not a currency token, you know, it's like an untransferable token. It's just a way to acknowledge that you have been a part of this project up to that amount or that amount uh, and so on. So it was kind of important for us because uh, when we designed the whole uh, system, we're like, okay, we precisely don't want that any kind of contribution become just uh, pushed or dri drived by an economic incentive because it will kill the whole open source ethos. So uh, the idea on Pondo, uh, at least like, okay, we do acknowledge this kind of contribution thanks to an untransferable token. And somehow, if there is an income coming, that it's up to all the contributors to decide how do we share this earning, how do we share this income, but it's up to the governance system to decide of how this uh, sharing uh, takes place. So um, basically, it does not prevent you to uh, contribute just for the pleasure of contributing, just to enhance the product, uh, or just because you, you want to feel like you're a part of this and you have just uh, brought your little piece to the whole uh, puzzle. And I think this is also important because uh, in such a system, we can expect that most of the contributors are going to are going to have like such a small amount of authorship into the world repo that uh, even though there is an economic income some at some point it's going to be like super symbolic you know because it's not how you're going to get a living out of your work so it's mostly to say okay great guys you've been contributing so it's acknowledged right now it's written on this blockchain it's never going to get out so it's always going to be there and well maybe you're going to you're going to gain like 10 cents at some point but Obviously, that's not the whole point about what you've done. So. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I have another qu quick question for you. When mainnet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, we expect to have like the Rinker B release in a couple of weeks, probably uh, during February. Like people are going to be able to play with uh, Pondo and Rinker B without having to like clone the whole code base and deploy on the local chain and all. Um, and then we would like to have a mainnet release for this summer if everything goes well. So. Amazing. Looking forward to that. <laughs> you heard it f here first. Um, so now let's switch back to Ethereum because that's what we are all using and without it will be pretty much, um, you know, um, well, not in a very good position. Uh, so we need to make sure that Ethereum is properly funded. And so I'm very curious to know, Aya, what, is, what are the steps that you are taking and the Ethereum Foundation is taking to fund Ethereum's development right now? Um, <coughs> so we do have grant program, as you know, we've been doing that more aggressively uh, starting last year since I joined. Um, it's, it, is, it is very important for us to basically, again, like our role has shifted and then now the Ethereum ecosystem is very big. We need to empower others to be able to build this and then it's also um, not just because of the size of the ecosystem, but the, the goal is to make this is open source. Um, we always think about the time uh, when we don't exist anymore, or I don't, like after I die, or after I die. <laughs> 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 um, so we do, like, we do think about this, like we do talk about this op very, very often, or uh, like even the question, like how long the foundation should exist, or, um, in order, so that's why I use this term, like we intend to grow small, meaning that like, I, I'm not saying like it's important for us to disappear, it's more like it's important for us to actually let others 
shine and empower them. And so even the grant program itself, uh, we did uh, give like, you know, like more than 20 million amount of uh, fund last year, but it shouldn't be just EF to fund those pro program. And so even the decision making of, of grant program has been, we are trying to um, involve other community members to make the decision who to fund. Uh, but also we are trying to encourage other to uh, join us to fund pro programs, uh, fund projects. <coughs> and we, we do think it's important to um, increasingly um, encourage others to join us. Like there are already happening, there, it's, it's already happening there. There are some DAO funding work and that the, um, other members are trying to build, which is great. We're happy to work with them or let them fund any project because we at the, <coughs> at the end of the day ef doesn't own ethereum it's not ours it's everyone's um, so anyone can participate uh, supporting these project and the more f funding um, systems exist i think the more sustainable our ecosystem mm -hmm. is and um so that's our stance so this year um that's that's something that that the focus that we're trying to achieve. That's right to hear. Yeah, I mean, totally, Ethereum is everyone. And I think um, one question that and one topic that we've been hearing here a lot is like uh, protocol uh, inflation or in general protocol pools that can be created at like the layer one to basically mean new tokens to have this into a DAO that then can basically distribute this uh, as the community decides to fund different teams. Is that something you would like uh, to see in Ethereum in the next, well, soon? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I was, I was thinking of yeah. like in terms of protocol, uh, protocol development and funding. Um, would you like to see Ethereum having some kind of like uh, native way of funding itself uh, in protocol development with like maybe inflation, <sighs> like one ETH per block going to a DAO, like then that's can be distributed? Yeah, that's that's a very actually big interesting question that I I don't think we can finish in. I don't know. Oh, it's already time is up. <laughs> uh, I'd love to discuss this because at the end of the day, it shouldn't be our decision. Um, I do think uh, the more I think about this or I personally think about this, that's something that uh, we should all consider. But um, but how we do it, 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 it's not an easy question to answer. And I like to have this discussion to be, you know, like more open to every to everyone because I think it's very important. Absolutely, question. yeah. So let's actually do that. Let's actually open it up to the to some questions, and then we have like three minutes, uh, so maybe a couple of ones. But if I find the mic, I can throw it away. Oh, there he is. So um, yeah, any questions for the audience for our awesome panelists? If not, we'll just keep talking for another couple of minutes, asking random <laughs> questions. Oh, now we can see. No questions. Oh my God, that means we explain ourselves so well. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I think, I think we are we're on time. Um, but this was really amazing. I think you know we got this like um, kind of oversight of from the from the short term, like you know, like my crypto, the EF. Where you where you guys? doing right now to make open source sustainable and make your own, uh, of course, like my crypto and Ethereum sustainable. Um, and also John and Olivier with like, you know, the future, how it looks like, how we can have these generalized um, kind of protocols and models so we can apply them to every open source project and make it sustainable, which I think will be amazing. So this is the future that I personally want to live in. Um, so thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us to all our panelists and, and thanks to the audience for being here.